<laughs> Here we go. What is up, everyone out there in podcast land? Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities today. I'm so excited because I'm joined by my co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. Been doing some solo shows lately. Jim, how you doing, man? Doing well. How are you? Coming to uh, us from a closet uh, in Spring Hill, Tennessee, yeah. man. But I like the Back branding. I like how everything's red and black, man. Everything is yes. red and black. We are totally on point. We even got the mugs. We are official. So uh, let's just get into it today. This is the show where, it's where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Lots of drummers, man. That's the low-hanging fruit because I got a lot of drummers in my life, man. And we make things happen. And today's guest is... Uh, uh, no stranger to making things happen in the music industry. He is a <laughs> Grammy and Emmy award winning drummer, producer, songwriter, inventor, author, educator. Our new friend, Trevor Lawrence Jr. What's up, Trevor? What's up, Rich? How you doing, man? And and just, you know, Jim, everybody, you know, what's up, man? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Well, Thanks if you guys are just, excited. yeah, man, we're, it's, uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, if you guys are just consuming this with your ears, Trevor is joining us from, it looks like a very official recording studio, tons of high end gear, man. Looking good there, <laughs> man. Three days. I, I just literally finished last night and man, I had to do it. It's been like six years since a real, real proper upgrade. So I went and just, yanked everything you know how that is once you do that you open up that can of worms pandora's <laughs> like, box i do this yeah yeah so we're back though so i'm happy man i haven't even done the drums yet i'm gonna do all that in the next couple of days but yeah man thank you it's really yeah. cool man I'm, I'm i love how it uh how it's how it's working hey did you just have a birthday a couple days ago i did on thursday yeah nice sure yeah. did man happy thank birthday you. yeah would you did thank you did you. you get out do some celebrating you know what? I was flying home from Nashville. <laughs> so what were you doing in Nashville, man? Did you stock up over at Forks and Drum Supply House and all that? Well, every time I, this trip, I didn't, I, the time didn't line up, but I just did it in December so or January. So it's like, you know, I do that every time I go. But I had to go film something I'm sure you're very familiar with, Crossroads. Oh, yeah. So literally like, yeah. So literally, I mean, we'll get into this later, but like, it's kind of how, my life has been it's like I really jumped through genres like for real for real so it's like mm. you know 24 hours before I'm on stage at the Super Bowl and a uh, day later I'm filming with Paul Franklin the goat of you know steel, steel guitar and yeah. Leanne and all the crew you know what I'm saying so it's yeah. just like man it's amazing how these things happen but uh, sure you know. It was well, fun though. Crossroads was really fun. That we did a we did a crossroads with uh, Brian Adams and Bob Seeger, man. So I got the the scratch my oh, classic yeah. rock itch there, you know. Yeah, classic yeah, rock. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Who that had for in uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm born and raised in L.A., bro. So, so I Rams, was here yeah. for the for the first Rams, and you know, I was a little hurt when they went to St. Louis, but when they came back, I was like, that's it. You know, I knew it was gonna happen, bro. There's no way. With the with the stadium and everything, it just it had to happen like that. Man. Yeah, as you a know? Tennessean, you kind of had to buy into them as well. But I mean, also, you kind of had to buy into the Bengals because the Bengals beat the Titans in the first round draft and first round uh, playoffs. Right, right. And then the Rams uh, had Jeff Fisher as a coach in St. Louis, who also uh, coached the Titans, and went sense. with them to L.A. But then they end up booting them out. So, right. I'm like, who, Interesting. Who I know Detroit's hurt. You know, we got their quarterback. He got a Super Bowl the first year. They had him yeah. eight years or nothing. But listen, we'll take it. You know, that's just going to, it just cements and completes that full circle moment for us. You know what yes. I mean? Right, right. Um, halftime show in LA. LA team wins. We Ton, won't see that again. Tons probably. of energy. I mean, you're, you're, you're fresh Rich, off yeah. that. I watched in who, real who time. Who are you going for in the Super Bowl? Rich? Well, you know what's so funny is that I'm not like a real sportsitarian, you know, but I mean, I th I almost want to just like since I've been like spending so much time in Los Angeles the last seven years, I almost want to just be like a Rams guy. You know what I mean? I'll just start wearing all the garbs and, you know, I'll have the hat and the hoodies and all my Nashville friends will be like, what's up, man? You're finally rooting for a team and it's the wrong team. <laughs> and it's funny because I was I was asking that question for a purpose, knowing full well that you probably wouldn't remember who was in the for Super Bowl. <laughs> I, I'm just always waiting for that. I'm always waiting for that halftime show, man. And it was it was spectacular. You're fresh off that. Yeah. And you were you were yeah. rocking with Dr. Dre, Anderson Pack, Eminem snoop mary j yeah. 50 cent kendrick lamar 
t- what tell us about what were the rehearsals? Because I remember trying to reach out. You're like, man, I'm in the middle of rehearsals, man. You know, yeah. It was, so here's, yeah. here's let me let me give you the fill in. So the fill in is I played for Dre, Fifty, and Snoop, and then the finale at the end with Snoop. Gotcha. I mean with Dre, and then mm-hmm. M's regular drummer, a guy by the name of Devin uh, um, uh, Webster played for Kendrick and Mary. And then obviously I couldn't say anything, but Anderson was the special guest that popped up with him. Right. So the rehearsals were, uh, man, we started in December. Wow. So we started wow. mid, mid December. <laughs> and uh, we actually did like, a, a, we weren't going to start until January and somebody decided to push it up, which was great because we actually got basically what was the performance in that set of rehearsal. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we ended up building on it after the holidays and stuff, and, and we just never beat that one to what everybody, plus everybody got used to it is what kind of happens. We all got demoitis, right? So, yeah. you know, it just ended up being, that was the, that was it, you know? Now going to the Super Bowl, obviously I learned along the way that it was a pre record I didn't know that. So all these years I was fooled just like everybody else, right? So um, I called some of my friends that had did it, but I didn't want to tell them that I was doing it because I hadn't announced it yet. And I just, I'm funny about that kind of stuff. Sure. So I was trying to get some insight. One of them did it with Prince. And, you know, um, they were just like, well, you know, it, it depends on, you know, who it's with. Because I think this person may have done it more than once, actually. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect, you know. So we went in and rehearsed. And, um, you know, I had the kid all picked out and, and done up. And it was all great. You know what I mean? And, and we recorded it. And then when we got there, I found out this is the kit you're going to play. It doesn't matter what you want. It doesn't matter the drums that they made you. We switched. The day that I got my drum set that I ordered is when we got the call that they had completely switched the color to white on everything. So everything was, oh, wow. so your drums were black and then you had to do a quick paint job, right? Is that what happened? Something like right, that? Right, no, no, yeah, no. So it's like, basically, I, you know, the kit I had made, it wasn't going to fit anyway. These are all things that just started evolving and we didn't know, so... We ordered, I ordered my kit that mirrored the kit that I recorded, right? But just in the right color. Yeah. That And then, so, you know, thinking that, and it was all approved. I mean, this is what we were going with. All the guys ordered, you know, black basses and guitars. And, you know, that was what we went with. Then we found out about white. And I was like, well, you know, I have a white kit. And they're like, no, no, they want to get one. They want to get one. I kept saying, why did they want to get a drum set for me? Like, why? what is this? What is this? has got to be a catch to this. And so come to find out, they went and bought some, kit from Sweetwater, like a PDP kit and spray painting. This is what they wanted to, the NFL wanted to do this. So I was like, okay, I mean, what can I say? You know, so, hmm. you know, um, it was, that was kind of a thing because it was small. It wasn't, you know, my configuration, you know, so we have a percussion rig as well. So, you know, I put that to the best of my ability, kind of reflecting what was reality, right? You know, and um, we just went and did it, man. It, you know, it was a, it was an interesting uh, kind of thing that we had to just deal with because I was super amped for the drums. Like I was ready for the drum set to be there, you know, but with the sets, how they were with those individual kind of, you know, houses or little structures, yeah. it just wasn't never going to fit. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, that's that, man. That's how that, that, that's, that's how a that lot to down. coordinate, man. I mean, it's like, oh, because oh. just the music alone, you know, gets it's like a big 14, 15, it's almost like a 15 minute medley. And in, 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 in yeah. essence, with multiple artists, yeah. you got the gigantic jib and you got all the camera angles. So when you guys are running this thing down, did the dancers I mean, that's a lot of dancers. And, and like, uh, were they there like for multiple days, like block? So, so here's how I went. Yeah, so we went off site at a rehearsal spot, you know, one that we all know in LA, right? We went there first. And then when we came back, we went to another place that was a little more isolated because the other place, you know, people just walk in because everybody's there, right? So yep. we went to another place that was kind of nobody was suspected. And this is still all band stuff, right? And we have a full rig to record, you know, wherever we go in case it's, you know, something's going to happen because there's people doing overdubs and all types of things just throughout. Then we went to the hangar. So the hangar is in Santa Monica at the airport, and it's a hangar that they use for rehearsal. So they've what? turned this hangar into a gigantic rehearsal place. So that's when we first saw the sets, and it was full dancers the whole nine. That was the first time we saw everything and, and felt everything. So that was maybe for about a week or just just about a week. And then we went to the venue, 
So the last week up to the rehearsal, we were at the venue. Nice. And I've heard through some questions that there was a playlist of all rock and roll made that played every time we did a run through. So the, mm -hmm. the community and the parking lot and everybody never knew what was happening. Wow. <laughs> that's how we, oh, wow. that's how it didn't get leaked. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I couldn't imagine that it did it. I, I was surprised that we got all the way to there with everything being in plain view with, uh, you know, six, 700 people and it didn't get leaked. That was pretty amazing, man. For that, So there probably had to be happen. some sort of like no camera social media, you know, like thing, you know, they said uh, it, they yeah. said it, but there's nobody's phones got taken. You know what I'm saying? They right. said people it a lot. Know. People know yeah, better I think than it was, to mess with the NFL. Yeah. yeah, because I think also, you know, it's so obvious if somebody sees you, it's you. And then they know yeah. exactly who you are. You're going to get, you know, because you want to, you're doing it because you want to take credit. So they probably figure if somebody's that dumb, we're going to find them and then it's going to be a problem. But that's why I was so, you know, I was very like, con you know, cautious with posting around this. You know what I mean? Like oh, absolutely. very much so, you know what I mean? Sure. Was yeah. it a loud crowd? Yeah, it was loud. I mean, it was sold out. It was loud for us. Obviously, you know, you got ears in. It almost sounds the same as rehearsal, but you yeah. know, it's like it's uh, it's definitely you know, the energy man was something that I'll never, I'll never forget. That was yeah. the main thing. Like, I was so worried about getting there because of traffic and craziness. You know, I left way early on game day, and you know, I remember driving down Century, which is you know where I was, I'm talking about like three, four miles away. And you see people with signs, $200 parking, you know, in some little restaurant, you <laughs> oh know what I'm God. saying? Like it was yeah. crazy. Parking got up to like a thousand dollars. It was unbelievable. Oh gosh. Yeah, well, if, it was I guess unbelievable. It, if you're paying 50, 50 grand for a seat, you know, right. yeah, a thousand bucks ain't a big deal, man. <laughs> Do they right. go for that much? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Went, the, the ones by the, the field. Oh yeah. yeah. It was like 50,000 a seat. Yeah, and it was like, you know, the low, and that's not a box thing. You know, those yeah. box things are different. That's a different kind of arrangement. Yeah. But, you know, listen, I mean, it's one of those things where if you're from here, the only thing I can I can remember that's that is, you know, the Kobe Shaq Lakers and the Magic Lakers. Yeah. Those are the two things that stand out, you know, that have this kind of energy, right? Yeah. It's just, you don't Certainly see it not that the much. Dutchers. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's like, you don't see it that much, man. I mean, this was a, a one of those LA things that it's like, okay, this is, we, you know, this is how we used to kind of feel a lot in the nineties and the eighties and yeah. we lost it. <laughs> I lived in Vegas for four years and one of the best days of my life we had, I worked for two radio stations out there. We carried the Dodgers as an affiliate. Oh, wow. And we were able to go out there and actually have box seat experiences in, you know, the whole the whole experience mm -hmm. it completely ruined me for the rest of any sporting experience right because I mean, you don't want to go back we, to regular after that no, yeah <laughs> no. yeah we went out for another game one time my boss and i and we were sitting there in a blazing afternoon sun and regular seating i'm like 20 minutes in i'm looking at him and going so when do you want to leave yeah this is that's <laughs> not goes, the same game <laughs> yeah, he's like this sucks i go it does yeah man i could tell you man four hours yeah. back to vegas and I left. I left right after we played because I knew that win or lose, it was going to yeah. be nuts, right? Yeah. So I had to leave because I had an early flight and I just was trying to, you know, I had to pack and I, it was just a lot. And I was like, you know what? I do not want to get set here for three hours waiting yeah, to get, right. you know, up the street. So I left pretty close before we won, you know, so we I, I had to go to another function um, because some friends of mine scored this, this, this show. Actually, I, I scored, I worked on it with them called right. Bel Air that's kind of popular right now. It's like the reboot of the Fresh Prince. Nice. And it's on Hulu, um, I believe. they had a little, yeah, they had a watch party, a, a watch party. And uh, I went over there because, you know, I, I, I worked on it with them and, and continue to. We're still, we're almost done. And, you know, just very close friends. So I wanted to show them some support. And then I had to get on home. So once I left there, it was like, oh, no, right before I got there, I heard that we won. And then it was like, when I walked in, it was like, it's like she's going crazy. Yeah. And when we were rehearsing is when we all in the in the hangar is when we found out we were going. So there's a moment there oh, wow. that I have on my phone that is unbelievable. Like Snoop, it was like, and then that's the first time when they're like, well, we know everybody's excited, but please don't post this. It's just like, dude, that was 20 minutes ago. Like, yeah. you know, a little late. But um, yeah, man. So quite a, a thing you just don't forget. You know what I mean? Awesome. You won't forget. That's a, yeah. I mean, 
a lot of feathers and it's another feather in your cap, man. You know, I, I talk about relationships a lot. I mean, you even had a solo record, you know, called right, relationships. Right. So I, I know you're feeling it. Some of these credits over the years, man, Mariah Carey, Eminem, Lizzo, Ed Sheeran, 50 Cent, Bruno Mars, Kendrick Lamar, Alicia Keys, Quincy Jones, Natasha Benningfield, Lionel Richie. Now, a lot of these people you play with at the at the bowl, you have already worked with. So that's got to speak to the power of relationships. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And my most proud moment about that list is that 90 percent of that list, I've written songs with those people. So, you know. As drummers, you know how we get looked at sometimes, where it's just like you're in the back, you're not really oh, yeah. part of the conversation. When I was coming up and young, um, because there's certain drummers I've spoken to, like the Gatsons and these people, where there were clear lines drawn. Like, we're going to make sure you understand that what you're doing is out there in the control room. You're not a part of this, right? So I coming from musical parents where I was able to go to sessions and stuff, I always felt that, you know, the drums are such a, you know, the, it starts so many things off. It's such an important part. So as I was coming along, the technology was changing. I just always wanted to be a guy that was included in that conversation. And it's taken a long time to figure out how to go from the control room. I mean, the, the live room to the control room, right? Sure. But, you know, it's possible. And it's yeah. all relationships and how you carry yourself and what you bring to the table. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like everybody just wants something great. So if you have that, you just got to figure out how to let them know that you have it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't just walk in there and, you know, you know, out of place and just demand something, but that relationship gets cool and people are more receptive than you think. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, in my experience, you know, so. Absolutely. You have, yeah. to, you have to show your worth. Yeah. You, know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, the more you hang around, the more they get to know you. That's how yeah. I got in the radio. Yeah. Getting that's the, around. mostly it's a story like that with almost, I mean, almost every successful you know, there's a story. There's very few things that are just like, oh, I did this and that and this and this and this. you know, it's it's always a story. That's something random or odd or crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's like And the more you get into the entertainment business, the more outlandish the stories become because it's not a, a traditional b business that you could say, well, here, like you're saying, here's the way mm -hmm. you do it. You know, Rich, you talked about how, you know, how did Tommy Lee get to be where he is? Right. He doesn't have a formal background or education. He just you know, yeah. yeah. One day he's, you know, he's he's playing in a massive rock band. The next day he's driving Lambos. Right. No, real talk. I mean, that's you know, like I said, man. It's and you know, whatever led him to those being in those right places, man. That's yeah. that's the thing. So, you know, I just try not to fight what's what's supposed to happen. You know what I mean in life, and and kind of go with the signs sometimes. You know what I'm saying, and and like um essentially just let let things happen how they're going to happen but you know you have to be prepared we know the old equation you hear it all the time but we have to live it. you know preparation success is when preparation preparation meets opportunity yeah. so it's like just be prepared and then your moment will come you know what well, i mean it's I like mean, talk about preparation you know i was scouring the internet watching all sorts of videos of you you know drum solos and you know your inventions and cool interviews and i mean you could totally tell that you, you know, you, you have jazz roots and you have a jazzer's heart. And I oh, see yeah. you play fusion and funk from. and, you know, you have a mm -hmm. very deep musical family. Um, but just that the, you saw the foresight to go, hey, man, I, I can make beats and I can play funk and R&B. And then along the way, am I right in saying that some of that forward momentum as a songwriter uh, and a composer came from your relationship with Dr. Dre? Yeah, some of that. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I come from, you know, my grandfather has a Grammy. I mean, he's passed, but my grandfather's a Grammy for a song he did with his quartet group called the Dixie Hummingbirds with yeah. Paul Simon in 74, the year I was born, called Love Me Like a Rock. So, you know, I saw that with Pop and then my father, you know, produced I'm So Excited, you know, and all these other record plates, sax on all the Stevie records. And then my mother was a 70s Supreme, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, my whole thing was, I know I'm doing music, but how can I get the best out of it? And I feel like my dad always said, you know, the writing, you know, that was always an old model. I mean, it's different. It's not different now, but things have, there's other things now that you can do. But back then, we, as musicians, we just thought about music, right? So what's the, either I'm going to go tour all the time, or I'm going to do a lot of sessions, or I'm going to write a song. So, you know, that was kind of what my, that was kind of what my focus was, is to uh, everybody that wants to call me to play drums, why can't we work on, you know, on records together? 
You know what I'm saying? And, totally. and, you know, for a lot of those people, it evolved into that and it worked. Now, touching on something you said, yes, jazz is my background. So just to be clear, I didn't come from playing in church. I came from playing jazz, nice. real traditional jazz. Now, obviously, being in L.A., it's not New York. So it's not like we're not going to have it. We're not going to play it in the same way out here as far as, you know, as frequently. Right. You know, it's a different energy with the culture. But we're, you know, real jazz is, is what I came from. But just as much, you know, learning funk and pocket and being around Purdy and Keltner and all these people, you know, Keltner's who brought me to DW. You know what I'm saying? That's like nice. family. To me. So, you know, um, it's like all these influences is just taking everything and channeling and learning from it, right? Learning from it is the main thing. We got to learn from everything. So that's, that's my thing. And my newest thing of like mission is I don't like to be put in boxes. So that's why I'm trying so hard to do all these different genres at a level, right? So let's let's talk about the last 10 days, right? So three days before the Super Bowl came out, Snoop dropped his album. I produced two songs on there. Then we have Super Bowl. Then I flew to Nashville. Then my jazz record came out on my birthday on Thursday. And then this Sunday, I'll be at Disney Hall with Herbie Hanks. So that's my life. And that's definitely different genres and all that. Did I plan it like that? No, but sometimes it, it links up and it makes you realize that, okay, you're on the right path to what you're really trying to do. I yeah. hate being put in boxing. Yeah. It's an automatic assumption. Oh yeah, you got you must do hip hop good. I hate that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true, but don't limit me to that. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. Hans and junkie and movies and all that. It's like everybody else. Don't limit me to that now. I yeah, work I with LA Phil. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's an incredible story. I mean, <laughs> I tell people all the time, you know, it's like, you know, we create opportunities for ourselves. Opportunities come to us because of, you know, people, places, they cross our paths. And so when people see me play, you know, rock country, pop country, they go, that's what that guy does, man. He must be from the deep South or something. He's a country guy. No, I'm from Connecticut. I'm overeducated, oh, man, you, play. you know, yeah. but it's, but I, but, but at least I am grateful for the fact that to be known for something is better to be known right. for nothing. You know, <laughs> man, you are absolutely right, bro. I completely concur with that. You know what I'm saying? I wonder sometimes when I'm when it's all over, is the legacy going to be what I did or the clap stack? I don't know which one's well, going to be. Well, more before fun. we get to the clap stack, tell us about your relationship with Herbie. How did that come? Well, I mean, because that's incredible because well, you're, you're working with Snoop. Then you get on a plane. You're working with Leanne Rimes, who can sing yeah. the phone book. She's fantastic. Oh, uh, unbelievable. Cross, yeah. you know, cross pollination of genres there. And then, boom, you're with Herbie at, at right. Disney Hall. Right. Hmm. So I started with Herbie in 2010 and it's supposed to just be one run. You know what I'm saying? Because previous, you know, obviously everybody knows that other person that plays with him is Vinny. Now also my, my young boy, Justin, like one of my young guys that I know that's an absolute monster. Um, he's killing it lately. But, you know, 2010, I get the call from a good friend of mine who, by the way, is out with Mayor now, Greg Filling Games, playing keyboards. Nice. So, Greg, you know, another friend because of just grow, seeing me grow up because of my fi family. So, Greg called me and was like, hey, you know, we need a drummer. It's a run in Europe. It was two months, man. I never had been out that long in my life. So, I was like, wow. I mean, I couldn't believe it because it was hard. When I saw the email, bro, I, I, you know, I did all kind of, I couldn't, you know, it was like a moment, right? So two months, you know, I'm excited, boom. But here we are 12 years later, you know what I'm saying? So relationships, could have ended at that, at that two months. <laughs> but it's been on and off, on and off, on and off this whole time. Not because nice. of anything negative, just because of my schedule, because I do other things. But there you go. It's a relationship thing. So now we're over a decade, you know, doing, an, doing more music. We just went to Cancun in uh, October, I believe, and did that jazz festival out there. And now we're doing this. So... You know, man, Herbie's the GOAT, bro. It's, you know, it's a different type of thing. You know what I mean? It's like for a guy that's been there to shape the music like he did and has all the firsthand knowledge, you know, from Herbie, I mean, from Miles. One run we did, and it's, it's very relevant now because it was in Lviv, Kiev. We did a show with, with Lviv, Ukraine uh, back in 2014, and Wayne Shorter played with us. So me, Herbie, wow. James Genius, and Wayne Shorter. And, you know, now and back then is when they were doing the whole annex Crimea thing. So I have this toilet paper I bought that has Putin's face on it. And I, I have it in my case, you know, very funny moment. But, uh, you know, um, 
it's like that guy is different than everybody else. It's just different. You know, he's just a different kind of guy. His age, it just means nothing, bro. Like when you're on stage, it means nothing. He, he's got that you know? childlike energy. I mean, it, it's unwavering. Oh, yeah. bro. Oh, man. And I'm, you're I'm... not going to play it. You're not going to like, it's not going to be a thing of, oh, let me tone it down. Bro, it's never going to be that. Like yeah. he's going to play where you're going to be. Okay. First, the first show I did with him, the literal first show, this is a running joke. Only a few people know this. The very first show it was of that tour was in Cork, Ireland at this jazz festival. And I was so nervous. I was chewing gum. I was so nervous, man, that I bit down and a feeling, a cat, you know, a crown popped off. And it was on the song Actual Proof. So after I told him the story, he was like, oh, Actual Tooth. Like, dude, that was a running show. <laughs> actual <forever>. Tooth. <laughs> <laughs> nice but i was so nervous man it was like the management was there like let me check out this guy see if it's gonna work you know and i have all these things playing the music for the first time and hearing him as a fan you gotta also listen to what he's playing and you're like dude i can't believe i'm hearing this right now so that was uh man you know that that's been one of my bucket list things bro like i, I got lucky with this bucket list man. you know i mean I, i've been able to hit these things the Super Bowl was definitely an unexpected one that you always have in the back of your mind. But man, I, I've been I've been able to hit almost all of them, man. And, that, and that's only because I don't control it. Like you don't control those type of things, man. Yeah. They just they just happen. There's nothing we can do to control these type of things. You know, you have to just let things happen, man, and put out the right energy and then things will come back. I can't well, definitely, say, oh, yeah, I did this. Yeah. You definitely That's put the body, out the right bro. energy, man. You know, and the fact that you can play all those styles is is just incredible, man. Yeah, I got a funny story I'm about still, the. Uh... I'm still enamored by the Putin toilet paper. I mean, that's uh, I should get it, man. I should show yeah. you, bro. It's it's funny. I mean, it's like I'm toilet paper it. that looks like it'll kick your ass. I mean, that's uh, right. Well, like they were, the, the funny thing is you got to think of what was happening. So he's literally in that whole, you know, <laughs> annexing Crimea, and this is what they're out selling out in the street in another part of the country, bro. I had to get it because it was just historic. Oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. Man, the yeah, I'm going to have somebody bring it in here. The best education <laughs> is travel, man. You've been around the world, man. It teaches you so much about yeah. people and acceptance and cultures and and just – you know, accepting yep. your fellow man, you know, it really does. I mean, I think maybe you've been to like 16, 17 countries. There's so many more I want to be to go to, but mm -hmm. right now a little interesting time to be traveling internationally. You know? man. Man, yeah. I, I'm glad I got it out the way. Cause I don't really know, you know, what that's going to be moving forward, man. I think I touched, I touched everything except Antarctica, you know, every continent, multiple places, except Antarctica at this point, oh, man. man. So, I'm, I'm, I'm fine know. with not going to Antarctica, man. Yeah, so you know it's like, you know, it's it, but you know it's a musical hotspot, right? Exactly. <laughs> but you know, I always wonder, like, what the hell do people live here for? But that's a whole other question. Yeah. So, Rich, you got to understand, bro. It's like, I know you agree with this. Traveling changes you, man. It really changes you as a person. It allows you. It's just, it just, I don't know. It's these intangible things that happen when you travel, man. So, it's like. For people that haven't traveled, you know, for whatever reason, if it's if it's because you're worried about something or scared of something, if you do that, it will really just change you. And even your when you have kids and stuff, man, it changes them when they take trips because you can you, when you, the only thing you're gonna remember is memories. You know, money comes and goes. Even if you have money where it never goes, okay, what's next? Like that gets boring, right? So the memories. Everybody I know that's like wealthy, wealthy, they're into making memories. They're not mm. worried about material crap. It's about memories, you know? So I try to adapt that, you know, in my life too, with my family, like, hey, you know, let's take a trip. Let's go here, you know, and they, it cultures them, right? So, mm. you know, it just helps you, man. It helps you be more diplomatic and it helps you kind of move around in different circles too. You know what I mean? You have uh, kids? Yeah, I have a, uh, my son will be 16 on Monday. Nice. And my daughter is 13. This one. Oh, interesting. Are yeah, they different? Same... Oh, send me that one too. Okay, here we go. Here we I go. I just got some toilet paper here. If you guys are. Is it the toilet paper? The here we go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Putin he is looks on the like toilet he's paper. just going to. Yeah, this is yeah, like. He's really going to. This is crazy, bro. I mean, the fact yeah. that they did. I mean, this is now. 
10 years old or eight years old. I've just been in my cabinet. I have this cabinet of a few like art artifacts that's funny bro. there's an instagram poster yeah. right there that's very relevant right, right now <laughs> i know i, I hope yeah. no one uses those by accident you got to put them in a safe place <laughs> yeah. man right yeah they're in my they're in my little case with some of my members Let's see if we can make it look like he's got a mustache <laughs> right <laughs> we, we didn't know if we were gonna have we had toilet paper during early covid man i was worried about that so that could have really been uh that could have happened <laughs> yeah man it was that was a tough one man you know you could probably yeah. sell those and get a really good take on them, if you oh, no, them now they're way. now now it's an nft <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> really did, did you do that no but it could be but i'm you definitely should. not i'm definitely not drawing any attention with that from him with me for sure. <laughs> we we were talking to Gordon Campbell about uh, NFTs. I got to check in with Gordon roommate. Campbell. Yeah. I got to check in with Gordon because this and I was were roommates be... and yeah. Gordon and I lived together in 1993, 1994. Nice. Old friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were roommates, man. Yeah. We just had yeah. Taku he was on. Really big. That yeah, was fun. He, he was that's the first Taku, time I heard of NFTs uh, right around that time. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because it came up in conversation with Rich and I. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about all the NFTs it was doing. I'm like, I don't even know how to. Begin yeah, about. yeah, I got a couple of things I'm working on with that too, with the release of this album, and um, you know, yeah, Taku, another old friend since like he was in high school. He did Modern Drummer Festival with me back in. Oh, you guys sounded great together, man! Old, I love it. Awesome video. Thank you, thank you. Just an old friend, man. Just an old friend. Great guy, you know, amazing percussionist, as you know. Yes. He was the guy, and he, he, I probably have told him this, but you know, I've always also been very interested in endorsements. So I started getting my first endorsement when I was like 15, and. He was a guy that, you know, believe it or not, I know I look so old because I have gray, but Taku may be a year or two older than me. And I remember he was at Berkeley and he was the most like together guy I've ever seen with like, this is before anything digital. So like with his, with his press kit and stuff, man, it was the best. Like he was so ahead with that stuff, man, and marketing himself and, yeah. and all that, you know, and that was very inspiring. And I really, you know, it, it you know, kind of led me to, step my own stuff up like you know how nam used to be yeah you know, i tell kids now like man i went to nam when we used to have a big big old thing with a vhs tape in it and a you know resume and then i remember when there, you know when there was a cd rom then i remember when it was a usb stick yeah. now it's i'll send you the link you know what i'm saying yeah that's we, like the history of nam bro you don't have to go to nam <laughs> but the thing is is that we all loved going to nam and pressing the flesh and fighting the crowds and hugging everyone and you know having cocktails catching up with everybody you know and 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 uh, you know getting the uh, nam thrax we'd get the nam thrax every oh, year for sure i mean you got even if you were just on emergency and like high potency vitamin c every day you were getting sick after nam <laughs> oh no for sure no way no way around it happened to me in 2020s the last nam we had same thing i was just like dude this nam thrax is never you know it's it never fails yeah. you know but i started thinking about it because i went 30 years in a row that's so I went incredible. 30 years in a row. Then I took a break. And I'm telling you, I feel like it's so popular with us because all the musicians, this is when we get a little chance to feel some shine. If you're not even like super successful, but you played on some records and you might have been in an ad or two, it's like you get to feel a little bit of what it felt like, you know, yeah. feels like for the people that are like uber successful, right? So I think that's why it's so popular and so packed and like such a thing because you know, going back to it, I know we're having it this summer. It's just, uh, I don't know, man. It seems in those those two years, it just seems like it's a weird thing now. It just seems like, really? Like, we have our phones. And like, what are we going to nail for? It just seems <laughs> like TikTok almost took the place. It's like, wow. Oh, come on. I, I don't want to be the old guy. Yeah, get off my lawn. I don't want to be the old guy. I got to get on TikTok. Everyone's like, hey, it's not just for dancers anymore. You got to do the thing. So I got to stop resisting it and get my little page together. I'm not good about it, bro. My daughter, had she tried to get me right, and she did a nice thing for me, and I and I never followed up. Yeah. I never did the, you know, because there's all these rules. I never yeah. followed off the rules. Ah! Well, you know, it's funny. There's a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and putting promos and stuff, little clips that I would take from some of my other podcasts. And sure. put it mm -hmm. there. And they, I actually, with the seven, have you heard of the seven second algorithm that TikTok put out for a while there? And no, were no, talking see, I'm, I'm not, I'm not knowing about it. I tried it out and I clipped a seven second piece from one of my podcasts, put it up there and it went just ape crap. I mean, it was, oh, wow. you know, yeah, wow. got a ton of, ton of engagement and a lot of people talked about it and probably the highest performing piece of content I put up. Nice. Oh, Crazy. well, there you go. That's yeah. the thing. We're, 
even in music, I mean, this is this is what's going on now. And I feel like it's funny because all of a sudden the veil is starting to be lifted with all of the stream farms that have been happening. We've known, I've known, it's like they've been happening. So now a long time ago, you know, there was a thing that came out later after countless people were signed and had record deals off of fake YouTube stuff. But well, now you got all these stream farms where these numbers are just not what they are. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And people are paying to get the numbers and that turns into higher show prices and higher, you know, higher, you know, getting record deals and all this stuff. It's just amazing that we're trying to outsmart computers. That's the success in the music business right now is how do I outsmart a computer? It's not how do I write the greatest song? A lot of times the greatest songs don't get the shine they need because someone just posted a TikTok, you know, yeah. comparatively. You know, it's just a man. It's a weird. It's a crazy time we're in. You know. Yeah. And you were talking about endorsements. You wrote the book on endorsements, yeah, man. You got a, a musician's guide to endorsements, volume one yeah. and two, right on uh, Amazon yeah, yeah. four ninety nine, well, man. Yeah. You know what's funny, man, is I used the second version. I just taught at Cal State University Northridge. I nice. taught hip hop last semester, and um, I used the second one because that book is a book about endorsements, but it's it's really a book about relationships veiled in endorsements, right? So, you know, that's why I use it because I there was a part I was talking about just as far as, you know, relationships and the business and all that. But, you know, like I said, I was interested in that early on and I just became a student of that, which is really, you know, endorsements is another word for relationships. Oh, you know absolutely. I mean? It's like, they don't have to. I tell people all the time, if they all got together and said, we're stopping endorsements, we'd have to pay for them. Yeah. Just, you know. That, you know what I'm saying? So it's no, there's nothing that they have to do. I mean, yeah, it's promotion. It makes sense. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's still not an obligatory thing. So, you know, I just try to keep it humble there and make sure everybody knows that, you know, I appreciate everything and, and you know, get what I need, you know, and, and you know, just keep it going. You know, we're collectors, too. Automatically, as a drummer, you're a collector. Automatically, yeah. right? So, you know, I heard stories about, Cats, you know, when I was coming up, some of the bigger names, you know, having, oh, yeah, this guy has 150 stairs in L.A., New York, and Nashville. You know, I heard crazy, you know. So it makes you just, you know, if I turn my camera around, it will kind of, I think I'm going to have to turn it around, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Sneaker. <laughs> wow. I, 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 heard, the, uh, I heard from the, the your sneaker 1988 guy. Air Jordans in there. No, I have. I, I actually have a pair of breads, so let me go get them. <laughs> what you're referring to, mine are not from '88, but this mm -hmm. is the remodel of the original Jordan bread. That's the nice. that's the reissue. This came out in probably '19, but that's the reissue of the bread. Wow. Anytime you hear Nike say bread, it means black and red, so it's B R E D. So that's these are some. Those yeah. are the shoes that. Those are the reason why I've always had my ass kicked in middle school because I didn't. <laughs> It was, well, it was a or, big thing. You have to have, you had to have Nike airs and yeah. uh, I, I was on the ground getting pummeled many a time. Cause I wore the canvas shoes from uh, Giltex. Hey man, so, listen, well, yeah. guess what? Those people that did that are probably not where you are. I guarantee it. They're not in a closet <laughs> surrounded by foam. Absolutely. not. It, it's, it, it is, it is a really popular culture, man. I'll be at the, there's a shoe store right there in Hollywood and Highland. There's a shoe store up like by Cantor's on Fairfax. I'll see these kids. They're like oh, yeah. a, a block, a mile down the block waiting for the store to open. I'm like for shoes. This is crazy. But may I, you know, I, yeah. you know, it's crazy. Well, flight club is the one flight clubs, the one on by Cantor's. And that's actually the original flight clubs in the village in New York. You that's know right. what I'm saying? And that's yeah. where I, started my thing because i was going to foot locker and i'm like this is not the shoes i keep seeing all these people have these are just regular and so somebody was like yo you gotta go to the village and i went to flight club and man i was like oh i see that if was you got the money they got the 2005. shoes yeah yeah that yeah. was 2005 bro and ever since then it's been you know I, I chilled a lot but i just you know it was a fun fun period I, I switched you know i went from sneakers i think i got into camera stuff for a while like that was just a ridiculous rabbit hole i stopped that and then i got into um you know i mean drums is kind of i don't even count that because we just do that yeah. got into firearms real heavy and really went crazy with that you know and ccws for the whole united states damn near and including la county which is the hardest um you know licensed instructor firearms licensed uh chief range safety officer you know, I went kind of deep in the two A world. I'm a heavy two A guy, even though I live in LA. 
<laughs> so, so you know um you know so that that was the latest rabbit hole i think you know so do you go and you <laughs> do you shoot do you go to the range a couple times a week or oh yeah oh, yeah nice. i go to when i'm like not busy i probably try to go twice um at least you know i'm a member at, at one range um that i go to a lot the indoor range i used to be a member of one of the big outdoor ranges we have called oak tree but i haven't had a chance to get out there so i just let my membership go for now but my other lane, my other range I go to quite often. And then it's right across the street from uh, my friend's gun uh, firearm store called Redstone Firearms. So I'm over there, you know, just it's just a, it's a culture thing. You know what I mean? And out here I go and I go out, you know, we do big trainings, you know, out in the thing, you know, outdoor and the whole tactical thing and, and wow. all that. That's fun. Yeah, that's very fun. So yeah. if you ever get booked as an actor, man, and a, in an action film, you're ready to go. You got all <laughs> you got all the knowledge. Because I, I took the acting lessons for like five years. I'm like, I'm going to have to get some training on a handgun just so it looks like I'm legit, man. But I'm worried, man. I mean, I'll shoot myself in the in the, you know, the the family maker, man, or the foot or something. I guarantee you, if I do it, it won't be an accidental discharge. Now, let's <laughs> just put that no matter what, no matter who hands anybody what. First rule, the first rule, treat every firearm like it is loaded yes. when i come home myself and take my firearm off of my person that i put on my person every time i clear the weapon i check the weapon i you know and then i put it away i know i'm the only one that had it i know if there's one in the chamber or not regardless drop that mag cycle that that slide and feel we, we do a physical check we feel in there in the barrel and we also look even it's a, it's a it's like a thing that you do out of muscle memory you yeah. know what it is but muscle memory because there's that time when something happens and you don't know and that one round goes in the chamber you're not even thinking you know what i'm saying and it's like you think you cleared the mag and that one time it only takes once man nope. yeah. so you have to do this every time so the fact that that happened I, you know, it was, I was so pissed, man. Oh, yeah, I was just so pissed off that crazy. that happened with that guy because it's just, you know, I don't, I'm sorry, but I'm not taking your word for it. You mm -hmm. have me a firearm. I'm going to clear it myself. I'm not going to take your word for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was, that's sad, but yeah, man, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the rain safety officer in me was like so pissed at that, you know, mm -hmm. but, but, um, Listen, bro, it's just like, um, you know, trying new things, man. The, the pandemic kind of what got me all the way in because that was the only thing that was open. So mm -hmm. I've been collecting. I have firearms, but I really took that time to just really go do all my certifications, all everything, and just, you know, take advantage cool. of it. Yeah. You know so what I'm when saying? The zombies yeah. come. You're set, man. You're set. You got oh. the training. You got oh. the gear. Rich. You got to oh shoot them in the head, God. man. Shoot them in the head. Rich. Rich, I hate, I hate to see that happen. You know, and Nashville, I love Nashville because you guys, you know, just went constitutional. Um, you know, and you know, like I say, the Nashville Constitutional is different than the Texas Constitution. The Nashville Constitutional is very level-headed and chill. You know, high probability if somebody's gonna have a firearm, so just be chill. Don't do anything stupid. Texas is like. If you cut me off, I'm going to you know, jump out of this car and shoot you. <laughs> I had an Uber driver say, he said, hey, man, roll your window down. I was in, I was in Texas. He said, roll your window down. I said, cool. What am I What am I doing? He said, you hear that? I was like, no. He was like, exactly. You don't hear any car horns, do you? <laughs> I, said, I said, no. He said, because road rage is a big problem out here. I was like, uh. That's the case, man. I don't want. Yeah, that's that's too much, man. You know. Yeah, what I, mean? well, I I grew up in El Paso. <laughs> I went to college in and Denton. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I spent yeah. a lot of time in Texas, man. Yeah, Texas is a different kind of. It's a different kind of you know thing with their gun culture. You know, Nashville is very chill. Florida, you know, is kind of you got certain kind of way where it's kind of weird, and then certain kind of way that it's conservative. It's it's pretty cool, man. But I carry in about forty. 44 to 46 states, I think. Mm. So I pretty much oh, wow. don't go anywhere without a firearm. You know, wow. I mean, it's just, yeah. and once you start carrying, it becomes part of your, you know, your clothes. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know. It's like making sure you have your phone on you. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, you know, you yeah. have to travel with it in the compliant way and, you know, declare and do all the things you're supposed to do. It's not a big hassle. It's not like, you know, they're, they're used to it. Every, you know, a lot, thousands of people are doing it. It's nothing separate or special is very easy and you just go through the process and you're on your way you know what i mean unless yeah, yeah. 
you're like I was the day after Super Bowl when you have a loaded mag in your carry on. <laughs> and you go through security. <laughs> so what happened? How, how did so what happens there? Like how does it take us? This is a great story, bro. Yeah, a great story. Great story. So the greatest night of the life, you know, of the life before, man. You're on like 20, right? And so I didn't sleep well. So I'm like, let me just grab this bag. I could throw more stuff in it rather than have to meticulously pack. So I go through security. I'm over in my gate, you know, eating. And this lady comes over, just one little lady. She's like, hey, sir, did you happen to go through security behind the guy with the dog? I was like, yeah, that was me. She's like, um, can you come with me? I got to, we have to rescan your property again. I was like, okay, cool. Cause I know sometimes they have shift changes and, you know, things happen, right? No, no problem. So we're walking, you know, and I hear the, you know, okay, I found them. Then I hear, you know, I see two guys come. No, no problems. Just, you know, two suits come and then two police officers come and another TSA. And so we're walking down the, you know, where you've been many times, that Southwest gate at LAX. We're walking down there, <laughs> heading back to, to uh, security. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, this is weird. I know it's not a firearm, you know, but at, in my mind, I'm thinking it might've been a round. I'm like, okay, maybe a round fell out in my bag. You know what I'm saying? Which, which happens. So I wasn't really tripping. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, can somebody just tell me what's going on? And oh, we just have to re-scan your property. Can you give us your license? Oh, sure, here's my license. And I'll hear licenses, your CCW's connected. So I didn't have to give them that too. I knew they'll find out. And so they're like, sir, we found a, a magazine in your bag. I said, oh, okay, that's what it is. I mean, the bag literally says instructor on it. I was like, okay, I made yeah. a mistake. You know, I, I, I grabbed that bag. I didn't check it. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm an instructor. I have a CCW. And then, oh, okay. And then I'm wearing this hoodie they gave us that has halftime show on it and all this kind of stuff. So somebody's like, hey, were you involved with the Super Bowl? Like, yeah, actually, I was. <laughs> yeah. <you know>? And uh, <laughs> I was like, well, matter of fact. And, uh, you know, so there's like, you know, the cop, one cop was super cool. He was like, hey, bro, look, I'm going to walk you down. We got to take the ammo. I was like, oh, fine. I was like, you want the mag too? You know, I said, I see you're wearing the 23. I'm a gun guy. I was like, I see you're wearing the 23. You want the mag? He's like, I can't do that because of custody stuff and paperwork. I said, okay, what's the easiest for you? So they take me down there and they take the ammo. That's fine. And then they take me down there. And the one carry on I had that I carry my uh, TD50 in is hard shell. You know what I mean? My, my rolling brain. So I had, I, you know, I was going to carry it, but it wasn't hard shell. So he's like, just put it in there and then you go recheck it. And that's that. So that's all it was, you know, because they say it happens all the time, even wow. with firearms, just not loaded firearms. But they say that stuff happens all the time. Oh, I mean, wow. it was weird, you know, because I'm usually, you know, but I hadn't even had that bag in like two weeks. So I just wasn't thinking. I was too yeah. tired and just tired. I wasn't man. thinking. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't thinking, bro. So, you know, but nice wake up call. You know what I'm saying? Totally. You know, like, they stopped the security. So it's like, you know, when I got to my gate, because, oh, you're the reason I couldn't get my breakfast. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, man. You know, but <laughs> it's all, it's all good. <laughs> wow, man. That is a, that is a crazy story. What is a it, change, right? Yeah. <laughs> man, like Jim, Jim is, Jim is like texting me. He's like, I want to talk about NFTs, man. Like, I, I like that. So, yeah. let's talk. but I, but for sure, I want to just, cause you've done so many interviews where you talk about the clap stack. This is an invention mm -hmm. from Istanbul Agop symbols, yeah. and it mimics an eight-bit hand clap from a drum machine. It yeah. sounds amazing. You could change the sound by where you hit it, the angle of it, and how mm -hmm. how the Tight tension how on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds incredible, mm -hmm. man. I mean, I'm a Sabian guy for like 20 years, but I might have to go sure. pick one of those things up, man. Well, a lot of my buddies now, yeah, I mean, I brought that to Istanbul Agop. So I was at Mino for years i created the stadium ride at mine so that nice. was i've noticed that they've probably patterned like 20 rides after it now but when i did it nobody had done that with the you know different you know one side is laid one side is raw the bell cool. you know no they hadn't done that before so that was fun and that was good business and everything you know even years after i left so you know i had this idea and I was trying to see who can make it. I didn't even think about a cymbal company at first. I was trying to get a drum company to make it. And it didn't make sense for drums. So when I finally ended up at Istanbul Lagat, just going over there after I left Minel, um, you know, the guy over there, Scott, he's really just a, a, a heavy guy and really knows cymbals and knows the vibe. So when we started kicking this idea around, I had some ideas of some things I was trying to show him. And, and, and you know, we, we finally nailed it after probably 
a year, two years maybe, right? And then it came out, um, I guess, four years ago at NAMM, and it kind of went crazy, man. Nice. You know, it just, it just went crazy. And I got buddies, too, at other symbol companies, prominent people that are playing it. We're not trying to say you got to endorse, you know, like nobody would care if you played a cowbell. We're not going to take your picture yeah. and be like, oh, we got you. Like, no, just play <laughs> gotcha. it. Like, it's, it's a unique thing. Now, even though companies have tried to copy it, it's still a unique thing. You know what I mean? Nothing yeah, I mean, sounds how, like that one. I mean, how does that work with like, because, uh, you know, I've done some kind of inventing, you know, I've got kind of like a bass drum beater called the Black Sheep. At I'll, DW. Have it. I'll have that. Yeah, you thank you. So, Come on. So, uh, you know, how does that work with intellectual property when you're stacking your... Uh, Man, it's like, how can can you trademark? So, how does that work? Well, I know in outside of America, it, it's it's much easier than in America because in America, they look at all those things. Eh, it's a symbol. Like, so everything just kind of gets grouped in, right? So it's like, you can protect yourself to a to a point, but we see what happens. Everybody usually, you know, look at Weckl, right? Weckl started holes. Now oh. everybody does holes. Ah, so, yeah. you know, it's like, right? So it's like, you know, and that was after he brought it to another symbol company that said no. Hmm. Hmm. So that same symbol company seems to only just steal things and not be creating anything that we want anymore. It's very Ouch. amazing. Ouch, but, I got you. Yeah. But, yeah, but nevertheless, I'm not going to, I'm not going to diss them like that. It already happened naturally. But, um, you know, the reality is, man, it's like, we all know where this came from and this as a genre and its own thing and, and what it was trying to do we know where that came from. So yeah, we, we knew people were gonna try to copy it. It took longer than we even thought. We thought it was gonna be immediate. You didn't see it for a couple of years, right? But you know, at the end of the day, man, it was just a thing that I, it stemmed from years ago. I have this one picture and I remember in the picture, I had this huge rack and all this crap with the D-drum stuff and all these things. And I remember I was with Jennifer Lopez, we rehearsed, it was dialed in, everything was great. Then we go to the gig, it's like, aha, there was no front of house. And once that you're trying to play a side stick and there's all kind of because of the triggering. vibration. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, you know what? For a clap, we should be able to get this. You know, Weckle was stacking stuff for the trashy, you know, gongy, trashy stuff. We got to be able to get a clap thing together. I just started thinking like there has to be a way. So once we figured out the mechanics of it and put it out, you know, listen, man. The first song I played it on was Galway Girl with Ed Sheeran. That was the first recording I ever did with, you know what I mean? With my boy, Mike Elizondo, shouts to Mike. So, you know, um, it just took off. We didn't know if it was going to take off, right? Because right. drums and cymbal companies like gangbanging. People are scared. To, oh, if I play all Zildjian, I can't have another, you know what I'm saying? So it's a weird thing that we do as drummers, right? As opposed to just going for what sounds the best. So, um, but let, yeah, man, it, it took off, man, and it's really a real thing. No, oh, man, you know congratulations. It's, it's, it's cool. Yeah. It is super Thank cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, bro. Yeah, that has been a blessing, man. That's a that's a great thing right there, man. So I'm excited about that, you know, and, um, you know, why not? Like, that's yeah. the whole thing. Not why, but why not? <laughs> exactly. And so, Jim, where do, what do you think, like, uh, you know, two drummers walk into a room? Like, well, if you include you, three drummers walk into a room. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what do we do with NFTs, man? Is something like, you know, what do we do? Do we take a picture of our of us playing live and have somebody paint it and then it becomes a thing and then we sell it for a high dollar amount to some crazy fan? How does it work? What do we do? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, what I've been hearing lately is that NFTs could be the savior of the music business mm -hmm. in that, you know, a lot of artists can now sell their music via NFTs and I guess, uh, you know, now the streaming services are going to have a little bit of a challenge as this thing kind of plays out. Ooh. So that's what I've been hearing. You know, um, I, I'm i still trying and struggling to wrap my head around what exactly an NFT is and how to go about it. I know that it's like involves pictures right now and little caricatures. Well, it can. Everything. Yeah, it can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but for the, a that's creative, thing. Yeah. it's non-fungible. So it yeah. can be anything. A non-fungible token is basically a I mean, way loops. of saying Right. Lose, anything. Right? Yeah. Anything you can get somebody to buy essentially yeah. could be NFT. And I'm actually in the middle, literally, of this new thing, because like I said, I produced two songs on Snoop's album and he's already the album's already been sold as an NFT for like forty four million dollars. Wow. So, you know, so, you know, right as we're doing paperwork, my attorney was like, you know, I need to 
kind of figure this out because this is a little different than a normal channel, right? So yeah. we'll see how it ends up. You know what I'm saying? It's like interesting because he's so forward thinking, you know what I'm saying? And a great, a great businessman and great guy. So I'm excited to just have real estate on something like that, just because nice. it'll go back in history as, you know, he, you know, started rebranded, bought Death Row, put his first record out on Death Row and sold it as an NFT. That's, that's history too. You know what I mean? So, you know, man, we'll see what happens, bro. I got some stuff coming for my release of my album. that just came out. We're doing the NFT drop with that and uh, some things coming up with that soon. Um, and it's an evolving thing. We're all going to need to learn about it, you know, sooner or later. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not going anywhere. You crypto, know? So, metaverse, yeah. NFTs. Yeah. It's like it's like Keanu Reeves is like he's like, I told you guys, it's the Matrix, man. It's here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Gonna, yeah. You know? But I have to say, I am glad that it's going to do something with these streaming services because they're robbing us blind with our music so it's oh, like boy. they need it we need a wake-up call they're killing us bro like dude they're just 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 paying us fractions and you know something needs to come shake that up and i think the major artists that are now doing this are like hey we're taking the power away from all of you labels mm -hmm. publishers everybody it's going directly to us and you know they somebody just Kanye. Look at Kanye. Look at Kanye, man. He's made a streaming service. I mean, a streaming device called Stems mm -hmm. that he's selling for two hundred dollars. Now, the only way you get his new album that should have been coming out today, he said two twenty two, but you know he always keeps it. I think it might come out tomorrow because his new his new Netflix episode comes out tomorrow. But regardless, he's selling this little player called Stems two hundred dollars. He's already made you know, several million dollars. And he was like, I would have had to sell 220,000 units to make this amount of money that I've sold before it even comes out. That is incredible. So he's basically saying, look, if you want to listen to my music, you got to buy this piece of hardware. $200. Mm. And people now, are doing it. It'll make it. Yeah, it'll make its way to the, you know, to the whatever. But, but he's sold more. So if he was in a traditional record deal, the traditional way, you've now sold what would probably take you a year or two to even calculate through their system. And you sold that before it's even out and it's all going to you. <laughs> Man, That's you know. killing the model that we've had for our whole, this is turning that on its complete upside. It's just completely demolishing the record deal model. Yeah, you know he, what I mean? He is you know, so yeah. forward thinking. I mean, it's like, you yeah. know, I mean, really, the last thing for artists is like they got to go out there, take the music to the people and they got to sell T-shirts. I mean, that's yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. Wow. Well, his T-shirts are to the tune of six point six billion because yeah. that's what his Yeezy empire is worth. And if you watch the Netflix, listen, I, I'll say it now. A lot of people don't know this, but I, we did a whole record with Kanye a few years ago. It'll probably never come out, but we did a whole album with him. And just the short time I was around him, it's like, he's a, he's different, man. He's different. And going to watch this Netflix documentary that's out on him, I got to say, man, they have it from the beginning. Just oh, wow. happened to have camera. His buddy was like a videographer. And I'm talking about from the beginning, before a record deal. That's smart. And if you go, if you go watch this, man, and then you see what ended up happening, it's very heavy, bro. Because this guy was like, this is what's going to be for me. This is what I'm going to do in this world with this life. And to see it back then where they weren't even, where he was going in the offices playing the music and they were like, hold on, I got a phone call. Like, no care. And him saying, one day, they're, one day I'm not even going to have to have my last name. They're going to know me by my first name. Bro, it's unbelievable to see that. And it was done without knowing. And look where he is now. So mm -hmm. you don't have to like him. The guy is the king of manifestation and putting it out there and believing in yourself. That should be the biggest inspiration, man. That's the biggest inspiration I've seen on anything on Netflix. Man. Yeah. I because got, I we gotta, saw I, where this thing has ended up. I got to watch yeah. it. Cause, Check it cause, out, bro. It's, it's called Genius. It's called Genius. It's spelled either, weird, but you'll see either, it. Either he Netflix. is a genius or, I mean, who are the people that were maybe whispering in his ear a little bit and advising him? Because how can you be that brilliant of a businessman? I mean, wow. Well, I mean, I think it's conceptually. I mean, listen, it wasn't easy for him to break into fashion. That was very public and very, 
not with they won't they don't want to let you in and then he did it in the back door through sneaker culture and then it became a thing so the guy listen man you know you can say what you want he's he's a determined guy and yeah. you know he he it's just amazing to see that from back then how they weren't really caring about him as an artist you know they he was a producer already but as an artist nobody cared right and it was like dude he he just turned he just killed everything that you you know just turned it all upside down and just went way farther than anyone would have ever imagined man you know it's very inspiring yeah. that's a very inspiring um thing you know very inspiring persistence and determination man i tell you what yeah. um, well you know i wanted to steal uh, or an idea as a programmer i've noticed that mm -hmm. in some videos you're programming on a laptop now with like a maybe like a keyboard, like a MIDI keyboard. But back mm. in the day, were, did, were you ever into the Akai's, the, you know, the NPCs and all that stuff or, or. Yeah. I'm sitting next to one right now. All right. I'll so never you... give it, I'll give it up. But back then for sure. Yeah. Before computers. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, I know it sounds crazy, but one of the songs that's on Snoop's record, I actually did 15 years ago. I just finally coming out now. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I just gave it to him about a year ago and I realized that that was Free computer that was just a, a MPC and a and a, a JV 1080. That's all it was. I'm, and you know, before we had computers, man, that's all we rocked in the 90s. And you know, that's all we did. You know, I got a 2000 XL in the closet over here, man. I just got I got yeah. the scuzzy staple. drive and all. <laughs> Dude, that's a staple, bro. Yeah. Staple. Yeah. I still got I still got hella zips and sounds, man. Yeah. That's like that's a staple. There, those things are going crazy now. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. are Richard, buying those things like crazy. Are you aware at one point in my life, I actually met Snoop? Well, oh, I was going to ask you, Jim, you know, as a guy in radio, I'm sure you met him. But and I got to just say this, and I'm sure all you guys are going to agree with me. He just is so transparent, cool. just seems like such a likable cat. I mean, to be kicking it with mm -hmm. Martha Stewart and then mm -hmm. do all the other things he does. And then he's hosting game shows. And then I was at the wine store. The other, he's got his branded wine. He's got branded everything. Oh, yeah. You know, but it, mean, it, this, a, it never comes off as like a guy. sellout. You know, he's just right. a, a likable cat, you know? Right. And he's taking advantage say, of the most recognizable guy. He's the most yeah. recognizable hip hop person in the world. Amazing. I, I could say we probably shared a buzz uh, in the radio <laughs> station because sure. uh, he was, it was 98.5 KLUC in Las Vegas. And he, he came in to do uh, a guest spot on the afternoon show. And yeah, he just, he, lit up right then and there didn't give a crap who was around <laughs> who knew yeah i mean no that's that's dog man the general you know, now manager, it's legal a lot of places yeah, yeah the general manager calls into the studio to the uh, afternoon guy jb he says is snoop smoking in there he goes yep you gotta tell him to put it out he goes nope <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but i mean because of all the air conditioning vents everything sure. is connected oh and sure all of a sudden i'm going i'm getting a contact i <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, I listen, really, man, Yeah, those, those guys were on that, you know, mm -hmm. and look what happened with that. Those guys yeah. were on that in the 90s, and now all these states is legal. I mean, yep. listen, and they've made a lot of money off of that. And a lot of people have made a lot of money. I've made a lot of new millionaires. You yeah. know? So, yeah. you know, this forward-thinking thing, man, it's it seems to be contagious. You know what I'm saying? And then I feel like, you know, a lot of times, man, we, we fall, uh, we succumb to projection you know when people say oh you can't do that it's because they can't do it. but don't tell me i can't do it, right you know what i'm saying just because you feel like you can't do it that doesn't mean my my story is yours it's a whole different story i'm yeah. i'm a drummer bro i could easily be playing jazz somewhere for a hundred dollars kill it but in a little club somewhere you know what i'm saying like how do you change into doing all these things is because you got to believe you can do it bro well, you know I saying? and I and I commend you, and that is forward thinking, and that is a great businessman and a great business model and awareness of all the things, because you know I meet people in an elevator and they're like, like what do you do? And I say, well, you know, I, I'm an edu I'm an edutainment, I'm an entertainer, I'm a drummer, but I also educate, mm -hmm. I author, I speak. You know, you do all these things that are under these kind of umbrellas. You know, you got to be brave to do these things. I mean, I think just your quality of life. Yeah, you could be killing it, playing at the big potato or doing some wedding for 100 bucks. <laughs> but the quality of your life is so Not much yet. more prosperous because you're a composer, writer, songwriter. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that thing, right? They say seven forms. You know, I, I was one of the numbers, seven different income sources or whatever is one of the yeah. things. 
you know, so, you know, you can look at it as like, yeah, I've had seven songs out, or you can look at it as I have music out. That's one, right? right. You know what I'm saying? Then clap stack, that's another, you know, yep. then touring, then sessions, then, you know, lecturing, then professorship, then author, you know, all these things become different things. And if and, and when you're not doing it for the money, because we should never really be doing it for the money, yeah. you know, an uh, old record company executive said, you know, never chase checks for when you chase them, they run. And that's the yeah. truth. Do it for the love, man. That's the money will come. You know, the younger guys coming up, I tell them, man, don't be caught up in money, bro. Get your skill set to get. You worried about how you're going to get a check, bro. You can barely even play what you're trying to play right now. Somebody <laughs> put a piece of music in front of you, you're going to run. Like, get your skill set up, man. Just, yeah. you know, uh, you know, get, get, do it, be as good as you can be. And, you know, and I have to add, that that feeling of being around great people and pushing forward, it, it really affects you because I went to Hamilton High School where Abe Laborio Jr. went, Mike Elizondo mm -hmm. went, John Diversa went, Warren Campbell went, myself, uh, my friend Matt Lilly, who's one of the biggest licensors in all of music and film. Um, you know, uh, countless people went to this school. Our principal went on to be the CEO of Hardware. So that's what kind of high school experience we had. It was like he was a very motivated guy to make this like real life fame, get the best people from all over. People were taking buses two hours each way to get to the school. Awesome. You know, and oh, wow. look what happened. So many of us are still in the industry, you know, doing things, Grammys and this and that. Mike, I believe right now he has the biggest song in the world with the Encanto song. So it's like, you know, ah. when you put when you put yourself around people like that it does right it does Rubs have up. a yes yeah, so the same way as the world the wrong people right yeah. so success you know, leaves clues as they say yeah where, where is yeah. that high school in in the uh, landscape of los angeles where is that it's a uh, culver city it's okay. on a street called robertson right near uh venice and robertson so you see it off the 10 if you're ever driving to 10 west or east but um, it's right in Culver City. So we would literally come. I was living in the valley, so I had to go over the hill on the school every bus day. every wow. day. Yeah. And we stayed a little extra for an extra class. So I didn't leave school until 4 30 p.m. So I would get home every day, six or seven. But that's what taught me how to play. That's really what taught me how to read. You know, we used to do full real score uh pr pr productions with the real scores. So you learned about that world. Not that I'm going into Broadway, but you learned about that world. When I started doing movies, it didn't shock me. Cause you're not, you've seen it before. Right. So mm -hmm. they prepared you for all these things. And, you know, some of us stuck with it and it worked out, man. So, you know, and everybody that I just mentioned, that's really still in the, that doing it. They were all standouts when we were in school. Like John yeah. was already a beast on Trump and he won all the jazz Grammys last year. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's like, it's crazy. You know, we know Abe, he's a leg, he's a legend when we we're in high school, he's a legend already. Yeah. You know, no one plays like Abe, man. <laughs> So it's like, you know, listen, bro, it's just just been blessed and, and been in some good, you know, positions, man, to to try to be successful. You know what I mean? When that's, you're what, doing, that's what this all when is. You're doing the I mean, I'm a big proponent. I mean, like a, like the cornerstone of my teaching as an educator is get your reading together. Right. Come on, so, man. So you, you're doing the Superman soundtrack with Hans Zimmer. Is that written out? Mm -hmm. You got the 20 drummers. So, yeah, so it's written out, but. I think to not offend people that may not have been like the greatest sight readers, we kind of just opted for that. Let's just learn it vibe. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because it did, I don't think they wanted to offend anybody if that wasn't your bag. Yeah. So it was cool. You know what I'm saying? Cause you know, junkie who's, who's Tom Hulkenberg, who's now one of the biggest composers. He was kind of there. Peter Asher was there and Hans, you know, so that was the crew. Yeah. And, you know, we just learned it, you know, and I later went back and did, um, Suicide Squad with with Tom, but mm -hmm. a few years later, but you know, with all those drummers there, I mean, you know, that was another thing. That's a bucket list thing, right? With all those guys and, oh, and ladies. I seen the, I seen the place, pictures. Like, yeah, because I'm trying to. Unreal. I'm trying to we think. Did two of them. I mean, if you got Vinny, if you got Vinny, you got Matt Chamberlain, you got you, you got Josh Free, Jr. I mean, I mean, everybody reads. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. pretty pretty. Oh much, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think you know. I think that. Yeah. I mean, I think it. You know, maybe they didn't know about the, you know, on the yeah. spot, that feeling, you know what I mean? Sometimes people can read, but it's not the, okay, let's go, boom. You know, it's not that. And yeah. I don't think they wanted to make anybody feel uncomfortable. So 
Smart. You know, I mean, it was there, but we kind of just learned the stuff and just learn, you know, kind of go over it and then cut it. You know, it was cool, man. We did two sessions like that. You know, one was like 10 people and then one was like 15, I believe. And it was just like, you know, we'd go and overdub some big drums on top of it. And it was crazy, man. It was crazy. That was a bucket list for two. That was that was one of those moments. And you're killing it all before the tender age of 50, man. It's like, you know, you're. Hey, man. I got enough gray. I'm a lot. I'm already. My hair is already 50. Hey, but, man, you know. I'm, all, I'm all I'm all the way gray, too. But I just started putting that, putting that color in there a little bit. You know, just touch you know I made a mistake the other day. I got the first professional shave I've ever had in my life. Oh, my God. With a straight That's razor. Cool. Yeah. That's they, cool, man. Were they qualified? That's it's bar. like it really just made evident how white my beard is. I don't know. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you go, Jim? Like so to a barber why. barber? Yeah, Louis yeah. Barb Louis Barber Shop is nice. yeah, a yeah. local place here. Yeah, so I'll say this, I'll say this, Rich. You know, seeing you do the uh, motivational things too, man. I was checking that out, oh, and man. just the way you've been diversifying and, and doing your brand. Because remember, we met when they revealed Maple Mahogany or something. So what's yes. that like? Fifteen years, years ago. ago or something ten, like ten. ten years ago? Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's like to see all that you've done since then. Um, you know, that's another inspiration because I've seen it and I know how hard that is. The the oh, the, the, the um public speaking thing, the motivational thing, that's a real thing, bro. And you know, people get to you know, it could change the course of people's lives, you know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, just and just your branding in general. So it's pretty cool to see, man, because you know, oh, you're out man. there killing it too. You know, I doing appreciate what you it. do, bro. Thank you so much, yeah. man. I really do appreciate yeah. it. Hey, we got this part Absolutely. of the show where Jim a asks really a kidding. random question. Jim, are you down for that? Oh, man, you caught me off guard. Well, I texted mm -hmm. you. But you so we usually ask you a random question. But uh, for those that Hold want on. to keep in Hold touch on. with Trevor, it's TrevorLawrenceJr.com. On the Instagram, he's Trevor Lawrence Jr. And on the Twitter, it's Trev Beats, at Trev Beats, mm -hmm. man. And mm -hmm. uh, always putting cool stuff the out album. there, man. Yeah. The album, just some plug, plug the album. is called mm -hmm. Hidden in Plain Sight. It just came out. Um, all you know, all the digital platforms, um, and it's in the jazz category because it's a jazz album. Um, a very specific, you know, I wrote it was inspired by John Lewis, who actually his birthday was yesterday. John Lewis, civil rights. Uh, I'm actually going to march the bridge in Selma, the Pet Edmund Pettus, on March 6th. I'll be there, like 2,000 of my fraternity brothers. Wow, and we'll be marching. And uh, you know, man, it was it was a product, a project inspired by a lot of that, you know, cause we were, we share one of the same fraternities that we're in and just, you know, a lot of great things that, that he was able to do. And, um, you know, I just wanted to memorialize that a little bit in a project and I did it in a jazz idiom. So check that out. If you can, I, I, it's called I love it. Oh, it's super Spot. vibey, man. It's got like some R&B oh, elements, you. you know, but it's oh, yeah. so jazzy yeah, yeah. and it's very atmospheric and great stuff. Yeah. Man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. All What's right. the question, Jim? The Come question. On. All right, here we go. Drum roll. <clears throat> what is the worst thing to put into a pinata? Um, probably um anything that has gunpowder in it or you know, uh rounds, you know, yeah, uh, you know, any kind of, you know, yeah, any kind of firecrackers, rounds, anything with gunpowder would not not probably be a good idea with the blunt hitting something with a blunt object like that. Sure. Not that you know, without fire, it might not, but you never know. You never know. So yeah, anything with gunpowder, I wouldn't put any browns in there for sure. <laughs> Just I was going to say like may get lucky, like like, get like live what scorpions. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be horrible. Why do my my mind always goes to like poop for some reason? I don't oh know. yeah, ah, well, that's that's where yeah, your brain that's, goes, that's Jim. That's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah, that's totally. awful. My, my brain yeah, does go that's, like that. Yeah. That's terrible, man. Yeah. Well, if you this ever is, did uh, that, a pinata. What tough. in the world? Well, it is Taco Tuesday, man. I, you know, my girlfriend has taught <laughs> me how to make super, super healthy, like, uh, you know, chicken tacos. Instead of using the beef, you know, you marinate the hell out of the ground sure. chicken and it's, and it's like cut back a little bit on the dairy. And, you know, the only bad thing oh, yeah, really yeah. is the taco shell. <clears throat> Sure. And the, yeah, I don't really do dairy at all, so I feel you on that. Are you I lactose really, intolerant, really man? I, I am severely. No, not. not 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 intolerant. It's more of an allergy thing. With me, uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just, and it's like it makes me sneeze, and I can always start sneezing. You know, so I I discovered almond milk during the pandemic. I went vegan for a while, and nice. then now I'm like still 
you know, 90% no meat, you know, it does, I don't miss it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I do the, I do that. I do the almond milk thing and, you know, try to substitute whenever I can, you know, but yeah, there's oh. so many great burgers that are non beef now, bro. It's like, oh yeah, you, you don't even have, it doesn't even feel like you're missing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to be going you guys to got uh, slim and huskies too. Oh yeah. You know, it's uh it's uh, I'm going to be going to gracias madre there in West Hollywood, Nick, for my girlfriend's birthday. It's all vegan Mexican and it's like supposed to be top mm. notch and you can get cactus tacos. Mm. Yeah. I've heard of those. Yeah. yeah, that sounds painful. I'm about I'm yeah. about, <laughs> this time next week. I'll be trying like it, man. It, they come they come with hey, toothpicks or something, or uh I'm gonna tell you guys, guess what? There is a great Mexican place in Gallatin, bro. Crazy. I'm talking oh, about oh. from being from LA and we went there like we went there every day we were there and for we were there like after day after Christmas to New Year's Day. We literally went there al- uh, almost every day. I can't remember the name. I can't remember I mean, the name, but I used to, I used to eat you know there 15, 20 years ago, man. Yeah. And you it's know like what I'm talking about. Killer. La Hacienda. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's not La Hacienda. <laughs> Taco well, Mamacitas. Oh, yeah, because they put you up over at the um, uh, the Opryland Hotel because you could just pop on the gallery. No, no, no. I was I was I was staying, you know, at my friend's, uh, oh, gotcha. you know, one of my guys, my buddy's place. But, um, yeah, we have, you know, we were staying out there, but we were. We ended up going there because and we're from here, bro. We were like, no, this is good. This is actually really good. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna shake some trees, my my uh, Nashville drummers buddies and gay and say, hey, off off Gallatin Pike, right? Um, yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Be like, what is that place? And then I'm gonna go hit it this week, man. They, they, thank you. Yeah. And you guys have Waffle House, which I'm so jealous of. It's my favorite breakfast place. We don't have it. So every I time only, I go I there, the, uh, you know, the um uh what is it I get? The, uh, surefire way to get bowls. the squirts though yeah it's, uh, <clears throat> yeah yeah <laughs> brown bowl with uh runny eggs onions and grilled chicken oh yeah i've never, oh, never had that just their yeah, waffle though is unbelievable yummy man yeah this so, was so fun yeah, you know we got to let trevor get back to like you know just making hit records man it's so nice to talk to you like all these years <laughs> later hey did we also meet um did you ever play the people's choice awards about 10 years ago i could have sworn you were there with alicia keys and I was, and we played the same I show. Think, I think that may have been the Grammys, bro. Oh, yeah. I remember us being backstage and yeah. seeing, I definitely was with her back then. And I remember us hanging backstage and yeah. our drums. So that was, it may have been the Grammys. Rich. It may have been the Grammys, 2012. Like that, yeah. That was, I think, the Grammys, but it could have been People's Choice too, because I think I may have did that with her too. But I remember I was MDing her back then, as a matter of fact. And, uh, but that's another one where I started doing records with her like probably four years before that and then by that time i had written one of the songs on her record that was a single you know did what you mean? write so, did you write this girl's on fire no new day the one after ah, that nice the one that they launched the cnn show with they played it like <laughs> six months before they started that show on Whoa. cnn you know it was just every time you go to cnn they're playing i was like yeah but Cha-ching. yeah that was the, that was another one of those relationship things. Um, but yeah, I remember us hanging, bro. I remember that. I wanted, I know this sounds crazy. crazy. I'm probably way off. I might be thinking about the video we did because I want to say your kit was either gray or green, but I ba- think that was Battleship the Gray. Yeah, I remember that. Bro, I remember that, man. I remember Dude, that, man. Why, yeah. We can't we can't go 10 years without hanging, man. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, my God. Incredible. Well, thank you yeah. so much, man. We're so excited about what's on the horizon for you. All this great yeah, stuff, man. It, we just uh, just mad respect, man. Oh, that you. means you've got that. to go. It is no, time to you know write what? a song. You know what that alarm is? Because it's 220 and at 222, I want to screenshot it because it's Tuesday. At two twenty two on two twenty two twenty two, oh. so that's what that is. I'm just you guys already had it, but for me, yeah, we already I'm, had it. I'm gonna. It's yeah, called he, Los Amigos. Los Amigos. Yeah, but you know what restaurant. it is here in Nashville? It's four twenty. <laughs> ah. ah, come on, hey, Snoop. La, it's Los Amigos, bro. I got you. Okay, I'm Los Amigos. Los Amigos. There that's it is. There it is. Los okay, Amigos. That, I'm on. I'm. Do, I'm yeah. hitting it this week, man. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you for having me. Thank you so so much, much, man. man. Jim, thank you for all your great questions. The NFT, man, we got to explore this NFT stuff. And to all you listeners out there, man, we guys appreciate you. We really do, man. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It really helps everybody find the podcast. Until next time, keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great one.
See you soon. All right. All right. Peace. Awesome. Very good. Do I hang up? Yeah. Thank, thanks so I much, man. Leave? Yeah, this is where the editor right, comes I'll, in and chops it. I'll, all right, cool. All right, guys. All right. Have a I'll good one. I'll see you, bro. Good thanks so much. Later. Okay, Bye-bye. peace. Thanks, Jim. Hey, buddy.